Okay, well, um, we are live, my friend. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, this is the third live broadcast of The Hub, yet it's going to be the first episode kicking off season one with the awesome, awesome, awesome Ian, my friend. Wonderful, Mr. Ian Beattie. Good evening, sir. Good evening. You're Good too, afternoon, I should say. You're too, too kind. I'm not awesome at all. I'm not wonderful. You should ask members of my family what they think of me. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, buddy, how's things? How how are you keeping? It's great to see you. You're looking well. Looking well. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, one of the uh, minor advantages of uh, being in lockdown is we've got all out into the garden and we've been doing a lot of gardening, a lot of painting, a lot of fixing up the house. So I've been getting a fair bit of sun recently. So that's been one of the one of the few benefits. That's awesome. And and how are you um how are you coping with this with this whole lockdown thing? What's it like back home? I mean, I'm I'm over in London here. You're 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 in Belfast right now, right? in Belfast we I think have been a lot luckier because we uh, received the benefit of the lockdown if you like at an earlier stage in our curve uh, so and certainly from what I have seen outside people have been fantastic here they have been very careful with their social distancing everybody has taken on the responsibility that they need to take on so our numbers are probably lower than perhaps the numbers in England uh, and Wales Mm -hmm. uh, also, our cities, of course, are not as big as the likes of London, Birmingham, Manchester. So that has also been a benefit to us. But mm. it's a very difficult, unusual time for everybody. It's so it's strange. It's so strange. I know. I mean, they keep using that word unprecedented. And normally in, in the media, they throw it around willy nilly. But they actually might have some gravitas this time. It it uh, It's such a weird thing. You know, it's it's never... I was just been talking over the last couple of days on various other episodes to, to various uh, wonderful guests that have come on. It's just, it's the weirdest thing. But do you know, this, at least in modern history, at least, you know, if, we, if you eliminate like the great plagues and the bubonic plague way back in the day, but in recent history, has there ever been a time where human beings as a human species has been fighting against something that's not someone of ourselves, a religious belief or a, a so, whoever you love, oh, you can't love, a, you can't be gay or you can't be this, that or the other or a, or, you know, just some crap that we're all the time fighting with each other over. For the first time, humanity is united against this other thing. And it's a thing this time, not a person or a belief right. system. I think, I think the last time in history was uh, the Spanish influenza epidemic in 1918. So certainly uh, in our lifetimes and in the lifetimes of most people alive, this has been completely, totally unprecedented. And, you know... I hope and pray that uh, something good comes out of this epidemic. Some good things have happened. You know, dolphins are in Venice again in the canals. The canals are clean. Uh, pollution has dropped incredibly in our atmosphere due to the fact that cars aren't out on the road as much as they uh, used to be. Families are interacting in a way they have not done before or maybe not had time to do mm -hmm. in our previous lifestyles. So I think hopefully, hopefully, we will learn the best of the lessons uh, that this pandemic will give us. And if nothing else, it has proven that we can change our ways and we can change things to help this planet and to help ourselves. Yeah, that is, that is. I, I couldn't agree more because I've been watching and, and there's been these weird things, weird but wonderful at the same time. Like, for example, um, the Venetian Post put out this thing saying for the first time in years, and I mean like decades, they were able to see the bottom of the canals and there was yeah. dolphins and all these wonderful, beautiful fish coming along where normally that's just churned up with pollution and old dirt and crap. Um, I mean, just here and not too far from here in uh, East London, uh, I seen just yesterday on, uh, I think it's the East Chronicle Times or something, um, this family of, uh, of deer has moved into a street. They've just yeah. taken over the whole street because, yeah. because why not? They can. And I think yeah. that's awesome. And, and to go back on what you were saying about the people, I think as well, that oddly, you know, we're, we're locked up. We're told not to see your loved ones, not to do this, not to do that, not to do all the things that make us human. Yet, we seem to be, for the most part, um, more happier and more forthcoming and more more willing to to give their give your time to to one another and and just be more pleasant. And I really, as you said, I really hope that when we do come out of this, whenever that is, I hope that that's not lost. I hope that that remains. Yeah, 
Yeah, I really hope we learn the lessons that we're learning at the moment. Uh, I have noticed it myself out in the streets, you know, if we, we go out for our daily exercise, we have a couple of dogs, so we would take them for a walk, and complete strangers are, you know, saying hello, how are you, and there just seems to be more interaction, albeit on a social distancing. Yeah, right? Even yeah. here, in a place like London that um, you've been to a million and one times, and I'm sure you know very well, it's just, it's, you know, any big city, right? They, they tend to be very isolating, very kind of tend to be a bit angry sometimes. They're just, they're all hustle, bustle, go, 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 and no one's got time for anyone. But now, people in London is going, hey, how you doing? Good morning, nice day. And I'm like, yeah. this is lovely. It feels like I'm back home in Donegal. It feels yeah. awesome. It feels Wonderful. so much smaller and more, and I love that. And uh, yeah, I just hope that that's not lost. But one thing also as well, and you made a good point, is the things that these leaders and so forth say is, oh, we can't stop using fossil fuel. We can't do this. We can't do that. We can't fix the ocean. We can't fix that lake. Why? Because it'll take a month and years and years and years and years and years. Wrong. Yeah. Look yeah. how quickly Mother Nature changed the world without us doing a goddamn thing. We done nothing. And Mother yeah. Nature's resetting our planet for us you know yeah. i hope that people realize that you know what we can be better and um and we 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 are the biggest problem we're the plague we're the virus on this planet and i i, I hope that uh i hope that people just learn from that and, and be a bit better and, and when the politicians if there's any listening um the next time that you're presented with the time of year when the budget comes around don't forget about the artists because arts is always made to feel like we're 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 the we're the side friend. We're we're the third wheel. We're the guy in the corner that people kind of want when you've got nothing better to do. Well, look, I'm not going to sit here and say that we're the most important. We're not. Of course, we're not. First responders are and NHS and the and the so forth. Those are the the real troopers of this. But yeah. when everyone else, 99% of the world, is sitting down scratching their ass, the artists of the planet has done what we've always done. But now it's being noticed. We're coming out to entertain. And I mean people like myself and, and, and so forth. But then there's there's high profile names like yourself and like Patrick and, and I mean just the other day I watched um Elton John, um yeah. uh Elton John, who was the other one? It was um Chris Martin from Coldplay, Elton John and um oh my god, the the crazy sixties guy with the crazy hair. Um Oh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, massive stars. Um, the boss as well. You know, Bruce Springsteen doing doing yeah. doing a concert. Dave Chappelle doing a stand-up. I think that's just wonderful, and I hope people remember that and remember that you know the arts are important. Um, well, back here at home, uh, we had uh, we've had numerous of our artists. Uh, Gary Lightbody uh, mm. did a Snow Patrol, uh, yeah, concert from his living room. Uh, you know, we've had uh, people out. Uh, I myself um, was inspired, funny enough, by Ricky Gervais. Oh, I love that guy. And, uh, and Ricky is just my number one. He's just incredible. I know. But, uh, whenever he did his first live broadcast, I watched it. I loved it. And I thought, well, I'm not funny. What can I do? You know, so <laughs> I started actually doing one poem a day. And it's yeah. been amazing. You know, it's been really, really fun because, uh, one, I've rekindled my love for poetry. Uh, and my wife has been so helpful to me as well. She has shown me some incredible poems I've never read before, and I'm using them online. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's been received quite well, but that's our job. We are entertainers, mm -hmm. and we keep on entertaining. And I've noticed so many people uh, online. Uh, for example, uh, Patrick Stewart, the wonderful, incredible Patrick Stewart, doing a sonnet a day uh, from William Shakespeare. And... I might have mentioned to you before, because he's doing it from his home, he's sitting out in his garden with his cat on his lap, his cat Glenn, and there's an intimacy it's lovely. that I think people find magical. Mm -hmm. uh, John, uh, John uh, Krasinski, uh, the wonderful man who's married to the just as wonderful Emily yeah, Blonde. Yeah, Emily Blonde, yeah. They mm -hmm. had uh, a quiet place to due to come out and it had to be postponed. Did he sit and mope and skulk? No, he did not. He got up and he formed an online platform where every day he searches the web for stories of inspiration and he puts them online every single day. Uh, I think I've seen that. Is it called GS something or G yeah. something yeah. like that? There's yes. three letters, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I urge everybody to look out for it because, as I say, John Krasinski is another one of my top class people. Again, I have and to agree with you. I do think people after all this is over after we've got through this if we get through this but when we when we get through this 
Um, and after all this is over, I think people will remember. I think people will remember who did the right thing. <clears throat> I also unfortunately think people will remember who did the wrong thing during yeah. these times. I think this is going to be one of these like uh, before and after things. Like you know what I mean? Like like nine eleven. We all know what we were doing the day before that, and then it, the world changed on that day. And then it's everything yeah. was after nine eleven or before. Yeah. I think this is yeah. going to be like a before Corona and after Corona. Um, yeah. And I said, as you say as well, I think I just hope people you know embrace this moment. Like like come on like in. In our day, like you know, our parents and our and our grandparents and our great grandparents, when 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 their lifetime, you know, big thing in their lifetime came to them, it was World War One and Two, and their governments told them, okay, off your ass, we're gonna ship you off to Germany, and you're gonna get shot at and blown up. We're being told to go home, chill, watch Netflix, and have a beer. I mean, yeah. it doesn't get much easier than that. Yeah, yeah people I, can't do it. I do think. In today's lifestyle, I do think our lifestyle today, our children. I mean, I have three beautiful uh, kids at home here. Mm. Uh, our children's lifestyle, it's it's more advanced than it's ever been. We've got the technology. We've got the, you know, we can watch movies on our phone for goodness' sake. Uh, I didn't have I didn't have a mobile phone when I was a kid. Uh, we had the old black telephone in the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, yes, I, I do think that. Our uh, parents, our grandparents, and our great grandparents did know what it was like uh, to go through very, very tough times, and you know they got through it. Uh, so it's a learning curve for all of us, and I think it will make us as a species stronger. I certainly hope it will. Yeah, me too. I, I, I sincerely hope it does, and I think it will. Um, but I think it's. I was just talking to Rebecca uh, Louise Smith last yesterday, actually, from the uh, film festival Doctor. We're talking about strategies and how festivals are now coping with this new climate. Um, I think whenever we are told by our governments or our respective leaders, whoever they may be, um, okay, you're good now, and the process of of exiting um, this lockdown will will commence. I think even after we are completely out of it. It'll take us a while to get out of it mentally. The mental lockdown, you know, when people get together again, we might not just run and embrace each other like we naturally would have. We'd be like, oh, um, is it still? Uh, uh, be, yeah. You're kind of weird in your head with it, you know? Um, and I think so. it's. I think so. I mm. think so. But for all of that, I mean, you know, with the social distancing, as I said, I have really noticed here where I live. I live in East Belfast and I live in a wonderful area. A couple of parks nearby, Stormont Parks nearby. Belmont Park, uh, and I have noticed for all the social distancing, people being friendlier, people mm -hmm. being more intimate, uh, people just saying hello, how are you, thank you, you know, if you move out of somebody's way and they, thank you very much, well, you're very welcome, you know, it, it, it is lovely to see that the majority, the majority of the people that I have seen out in the streets have been uh, fantastic, mm -hmm. so even if there is that, you know, when we get over this, that level of social distancing, I hope none of us forget how we've managed to come together. Yeah, this crisis. I, I totally, totally agree. That nicely takes us on to. I want to talk about your poem a day because uh, when you started doing that, um, obviously we're friends on on the various platforms and so forth, and and I've seen those, and I think it's absolutely wonderful. Um, and I've been watching every day as you've been doing the various different poems, and we have one that we're going to play um, now in a second. Um, and I think, do you know what? Maybe I'll play it first because that'll give us a good sense of what it's about, and then we can talk about it afterwards. Wonderful. Let me just pull my. Where is it? My. There we go. Hi, I'm Ian. Welcome to One Poem a Day. This poem is dedicated to my lifelong friend, Charles O'Neill, who passed away one year ago today. The O'Neill family, who I all love to Roma Tumulty and her family, to Mark O'Shea and his family. Thanks to my brother Stuart, he knows why. Not so much a poem as a Native American prayer. When I am dead, cry for me a little. Think of me sometimes, but not too much. Think of me now and again as I was in life. At some moments it's pleasant to recall, but not for long. Leave me in peace, and I shall leave you in peace. And while you live, let your thoughts be with the living. 
Look after yourselves, look after each other. If you can, help those who need it, and above all, stay home and stay safe. All my love to all of you. Ian, buddy, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's a special one for me because the reason why I thanked uh, my brother Stuart uh, before I started reading the poem, uh, my brother Stuart uh, read that out at my mother's funeral in 1997. Uh, and it was an anniversary. Uh, first of all, uh, my very lifelong friend, Charles O'Neill, had passed away a year ago that day. Also an extraordinary woman, uh, Roma Tumulty, who was a, 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 an absolute giant of the arts here in the province. Uh, she passed away last week, uh, and I was also remembering my old friend and fantastic actor, uh, Mark O'Shea. And I thought it was a, a fitting tribute to each and every one of them. Uh, but it's also a beautiful, it, it's a beautiful sentiment. And it, 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 it's, it's one that uh, was very, very close to my heart. Yeah, I, I think I think honestly, it's it's very, it's beautiful and and um and it's very obvious when when you're reading it that that it means quite a quite a great deal to you. Um, it's not just something that you're reading, and that's that's really lovely. Um, but how how have you found that that's been received by just by the ethos of the internet? Well, so far, I mean, the amount of uh, likes I've been getting, the amount of uh, sort of retweets, people uh, sharing it on Facebook. It has been received remarkably well. And uh, my uh, good friend, uh, Mary Louise Muir, who's the arts correspondent for BBC Northern Ireland, she actually uh, has started to bring me on to her Saturday show, uh, The Culture Cafe, uh, which is being done pretty much online like everything else is being done at the moment. And so I'm doing one poem a week for her as well. So it, it, has, been, it, has, been, it has been remarkably uh, well received as I say you know I just wanted to do something to touch base with people to touch base with my friends on Facebook my friends on Instagram and uh, my friends on Twitter and uh, since then I have made so many more friends on those platforms it has been wonderful uh, just to let people know you know we're all in this together and if I can if I can give them a minute's respite from the worry Mm -hmm. Or if I can make them think about something, or if I can make them pick up a book and have a look, or make them search for a particular poet and look at a bit more of their work, then it will not have been in vain. But so far, it's been extraordinarily well received. I've been very, very happy. And I've been happy that I've been able to do something. Mm. You know, as I say, you know this, we are entertainers. This is our job. And uh, we're all stuck at home, and we can sit at home, and we can sit in front of the TV all day, all night, or we can do something. Mm -hmm. And it's been so inspirational. You know, so many people have uh, got up there and done something. I was, I was, I have to tell you, I was watching something yesterday and uh, again, inspirational. It was, um, it was put on uh, Twitter and Facebook and it was Brad Pitt. Oh, wow. And he was playing, is it Dr. Fauci? Uh, yeah, yeah. The president's advisor. Mm hmm. But it was the opening of last week's Saturday Night Live where he was playing Dr. Fauci. And I mean, he was wonderful. And again, I urge everyone who is watching this to look up Brad Pitt as Dr. Fauci. He, it was hilarious. It was funny. It was incredible. But then at the very end, it was most, most touching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I won't say any more because I won't spoil it for you. Okay. Uh, but watch it to the end. Uh, and, you know, whenever you see stuff like that, it's just it's inspirational. It really, really is. It yeah, is I'm a bit... absolutely inspirational. I remember, funny enough, who was it? Um, um, I cannot remember. Was it uh, uh, Gal uh, Gatto, uh, who played uh, Wonder Woman? Oh, Gail Gatto. Yeah, yeah. A load of people online together, and you know, they were all singing the song "Imagine." Oh, John and Lennon, got amazing! All these people together to do this. All these famous celebrities, these big top stars, and they were all doing a line here and a line there. And I thought it was wonderful. Yet for some reason, some people came out and criticised it. I just didn't understand that. No, I just didn't understand where the criticism came from because you know, they were all trying to do something, just touch base with people. Yeah, and that there was nothing more than that. That was all they were trying to do. And I was actually quite disappointed by some of the criticism, to be honest with you. But that's our life, isn't it? I mean, everybody. <laughs> you can you can never keep everyone happy, you know. And that's you can never uh, please everyone. There's, I mean, there's some. 
I, <laughs> I posted a video on my, or I reposted or whatever, um, shared, whatever you want to call it, a video of this lady from uh, from Florida um, who put a, a video on her page or whatever. And essentially, the gist of the video was she was appealing to the, the mayor or, or the councillor or wh- whatever the hell that runs Florida, um, saying that, that he or she should open the beaches because they in Fort Lauderdale don't, and I quote, drink Mexican beer like the Mexican, Corona beer like the Mexicans. So they're all good. She thinks it dire- it's, it, getting Corona comes directly from drinking Corona beer. I mean, there's just some people that are just morons um, and there's never going to be happy. You know, that's, a, you know, something as well. I'm like, I'm not, I'm definitely not uh, someone who's, who's, uh, I'm not a big fan of the establishment. I'm not a fan of governments and so forth. But for the first time ever, I think that maybe, for, at least for the most part, are all our governments are actually working in their best interest. And people are giving them such a hard time. And yes, it's their job to be prepared. And maybe they weren't as prepared as they should have been. But this is new to us all. And they are just human beings too. They don't know what the hell to do, no more than anyone else. So, you know, they're doing their best. So cut them some slack. I just think that everyone's jumping on the bandwagon, expecting everyone everyone to like to have this down. This has not happened before. This is the first time. Come on, but um, absolutely, yeah. And there's something I do on the show. It's called what well, I call it. I mean, the three W's. Uh, so I'm going to do that now because I, I like to, especially with uh, the performers, I, I like to get into that. And it's the three W's is where, why, and when. Um, okay. So the the acting bug or the creativity bug or or whatever form of creativity got you first. How or where, why, and when did that happen to you? Okay. Um... I'm not sure how many people know this. When I was seven, my father took me to a circus owned by a friend of his, who later I knew as Uncle Jim, Jim Beck. And uh, it was a Wednesday afternoon, uh, matinee performance. So uh, I went around the back of the tent with Uncle Jim and he brought me into one of the caravans and he said, what do you like about the circus? I "I love clowns. So he painted a clown's face on me. Great, wonderful, brilliant, that's great. And then he took me around to the back of the tent where all the acts were waiting to go on. So there was a fire eater over there and there was the horses, they were ready to come on. And there was a clown act on, actually out in the ring at that moment in time. And Uncle Jim said, so you really want to be a clown? And I went, yeah. And he opened the curtain and he threw me out in front of 1,500 people. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that for four years. Oh, what? You know, I was the only boy. You did I was the only boy who didn't have to run away to the circus. <laughs> you were brought there by the family. <laughs> yep, every weekend. It ran from March to September. Every weekend I would go, I would be the clown, I would do this, I would do that, do everything else. And every summer, I would tour around Northern Ireland. This was from 1972 to 1976, which was the height of the troubles. And I toured around Northern Ireland with this circus, Circus Delebeck was its name and it was named Della Beck because Jim's wife was called Della. So it was wow. Circus Della Beck. And I toured for four years, uh, every summer and weekends, whenever it was close to Belfast, Easter holidays, that sort of thing. And that's where I got bitten by the bug. And <laughs> obviously the, the circus, that's, that's an incredible story. So you were you were clowning for this Della Beck Circus for four years between 76 and, what do you say? 70, 76 and 76. That's incredible. That's I only retired when I, whenever I moved up to senior school. <laughs> I had to sort of give it up then. <laughs> think, are we ever going to see you in the big top again? I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, again, uh, my wife and my kids say there's, you know, there's a story there. There's a, there's a TV show there. You know, it would be cool. I have not been creative enough, and I think it's time to sit on my backside and get writing because there is a wonderful story there. Absolutely. I think it's, I mean, the whole circus life is really interesting to me because it's something that's like outside of the fringes of society. Um, yeah. I think it's really cool. But maybe if a movie, like, I don't know, what was the one Hugh Jackman done recently where he was the circus? The greatest showman. Exactly. If something like that came along where you could incorporate your acting career and like tr- traditional filmmaking with your knowledge of the circus, that'd be really cool. Yeah. The lovely thing is, I mean, you know, I am. As I say, I've been prompted and I'm going to sit down and start writing. It's all true. And, Mm. you know, there were some amazing stories. There were some funny, funny times. It was the most wonderful. It was the best of times. I mean, Mm. for a kid, it was like being in in, in magic land. It was just wonderful. Is it really like a big family, like they say? 
all the performers? That's exactly what we were. And it was the most magical time for me. Wow. And sometimes, you know, I take it for granted. And then I just start thinking about all the wonderful things that happen. And I, I, I will sit down, I, I promise you, and I promise everybody out there, it's time to start writing that story. There's a circus movie coming. Awesome. I love it. Do you think that the, that the circus and what you did within it and the lessons you learned uh, as a young boy growing up into a young adult and that as one thing, but also the the performance element of the circus. Do you think that, uh, or how did that lend itself to your acting career when it was when you got into the in front of a camera and that was more, you know, a more uh, technical side of things and very different, but still performance nonetheless. It was funny. I mean, from a very young age, uh, partly due to the circus and the performance aspect of that, I wanted to be an actor. I mean, I, I could remember telling people from the age of eight or nine, "I'm going to be an actor." Uh, no matter, you know, and I, I have always, always never, I, I, sorry, I've never made that a secret that I always wanted to be an actor. But when I wanted to be an actor, I saw myself on the screen. Mm -hmm. I didn't see myself necessarily, I, I mean, I really didn't imagine theater <laughs> as being a side of that. For me, the magic was always on screen. Yeah. That sense of escapism, you know, the wonderful films that I used to watch as a child, the wonderful films and television shows that I watch now. Uh, for me, it's a form of escapism, it's entertainment. And, you know, you just get attached to characters. Uh, there's characters you love, characters you hate, characters you love to hate characters you hate to love you know it's just yeah. the magic of cinema the magic of the screen because uh, i won't narrow it down to cinema i will mm -hmm. talk about the screen because so much incredible stuff is now coming on our television uh, platforms yeah i mean because you and i are from well i'm not from belfast i'm from donegal but you know very close and I th what was the mentality because i know when i'm I, like you uh i wanted to be an actor from day dot and i yeah. didn't make that i didn't hide that fact but it, the the kind of uh, um reply that i got when i was like oh i'm going to be an actor they were like oh Cool. Uh, so, what's your real job? What, what's the what's the backup going to be? <laughs> okay, then. Yeah. No. Well, whenever I uh, went to my careers master in uh, Methodic, my old school, uh, and said I wanted to be an actor, he laughed at me. <laughs> I mean, there, nothing at all. There wasn't even sort of information in, at that time. There wasn't information about drama colleges or whatever. Um, so basically. I did it myself, although to be fair, I did go to university first and study law and qualified as a barrister before I took the step of going to drama college and I went to drama college de Lambda actually on the one year course. Uh, so that's what, if you like, broke me in, but I got something under my belt first. Mm -hmm. Um, just to let people know, we are also we're going out live right now on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitch uh, and uh, Twitter. Um, so you can get your comments and get your messages in here and we'll, we'll pop them over to Ian and anything you want to know. Um, but that nicely takes us on as well as, do you know, I mean, when you were starting out and even myself as well, um, there was this, um, this, this thing that like, if you were in movies, then you were a movie star. If you were in television, then you were, oh, it's just a bit, bit of telly, you know what I mean? Like Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise were the movie stars and in the late eighties, nineties, even, even into the late nineties. TV people, pff, who cared? Um, but then TV started to get so good. Oh, my God. And now I, I, I firmly believe that it's far better than cinema, um, not just in its quality, but in its absolute diversity and the diversity of stories. And that nicely takes me on to um, your TV work. Uh, and that's just kind of awesome, man. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I, I mean, dude. I look, I was lucky. I was how did that how did that come like how did how did that like that day because like you've done a lot of stuff uh yeah. on tv on film um big movies and we'll go into some of them in a minute some bigger stuff some smaller stuff but like game of thrones that that is a different beast i it mean was almost like it was i i can't emphasize this enough it was luck it was just being in the right place at the right time and the right face. I auditioned for Game of Thrones season one, not for the trailer that made the tra uh, that made the pilot, and then HBO had gone and seen the pilot and greenlit the series. So they were casting for the series, and I got seen for a role, and I didn't get it, and I was 
furious. I was thinking to myself, right, they're flying some guy over from London, okay? Uh-huh. They're going to put him up in a hotel. I live five minutes away from the studio. Come on, guys. <laughs> You're going to save money if you employ me. So, of course, I didn't get the role. And furious, fit to be tied. Uh, but four weeks later, they then auditioned me, and it was a local casting director who was helping uh, Nina Gold and Robert Stern. It's Carla, right? Uh, they, uh, Carla, strong, wonderful, wonderful girl. Yeah. And uh, so they brought me in and auditioned me for Sir Mary Trant. And I got it. And uh, <laughs> so... Um, That's amazing. It, well, it was amazing. The, the, the role I auditioned for originally was Jory Cassell, Ned Stark's right-hand man who gets knifed in the eye, season one, episode five. Oh, okay. Five years later, I'm still playing Sir Marin Trant. <laughs> but I have to say also, uh, the actor who played Jory Cassell, uh, a Scots actor uh, by the name of uh, Jamie Seaves, uh, mm-hmm. was fantastic. He was perfect in the role of Jory. He, he was just so perfect. And that was one of the magical things about Thrones. The casting was immaculate. It was unbelievable. Yeah, except for, except for, except for one. Man, th- I, dude, you, you were fantastic in it. But like that must have been. Well, first of all, a couple of things. By the way, by the way, the one I'm talking about is Ed Sheeran. <laughs> oh, oh my God! How did that happen? I, I, do you know what? I, well, no, I, I, how that happened. And here's the inside story. It was Maisie. It was Maisie's birthday. Really? And, uh, uh, he was put in the show as a as a birthday present. I mean, no harm to you. Sorry, guys, get her a pony. <laughs> I know, right? You know, I thought to myself, like, I was like, Game of Thrones is so big, it doesn't need to be taking, like, you know, empty plugs like that. Uh, but no, th- the fact that it's, you know, just like a little inside scoop for, for, uh, for Maisie, then that's actually cooler. That's even better. That, I like that. There, there is something very, very cool about it. I mean, Gary Lightbody was in Game of Thrones. Nobody saw him or recognized him. Mm-hmm. But Gary was there along with uh, a, a, a couple of members of the band. They were, uh, I think, I may be wrong on this, but I actually think they were in the episode The Reigns of Castamere. Really? I may be wrong. I would need to check that. I don't take it as red. Okay. I'll look at it and come back at you on that one. But two, okay, two things I want to get into with this is, first of all, as I said before, you've done so much stuff, some big, middle, and small stuff, TV, film, whatever, but, like, the day you arrived on Thrones, I mean, that thing, well, that, you know, that's the, a... The con- incredible thing about uh, uh, my first day on set, literally, my first day on set, was the day I killed Cyril Pharrell. And I'd done the research, right? I'd done the research on the character, what research there was, opinions about this character from the books, arrogant, snide, whatever, cowardly, whatever. So I remember thinking, before I got on set, uh, I reached the conclusion that uh, old Sir Merrin was um, a coward, a thug, a bully, and not really that fit to be a king's guard. And to disguise that, he would uh, have this expression as if he'd just stepped on something. And the something was the piece of shit he was looking at. And that's where wow. that came from. <laughs> wow. So, that's very that's cool. The expression came from, and obviously the boys, uh, David and Dan, and the geniuses who ran the show, they loved it. And they thought, yep, that's it. Uh, and they always kept me right with the character. You know, yes, he's this. No, he's not that. Mm-hmm. But that- um, it was the most wonderful day. Because, say, uh, uh, Miltos, uh, your Emily, who played uh, Sirio, who was a huge fan favourite, and I get to kill him on the first day on set. <laughs> I also got to meet Maisie for the first time, and my last day on set was also with Maisie. It was the most remarkable experience. Season one, it was a great show. You could see, you know, uh, the storylines, the things that were going on, the, the, the size of it, you know. Uh, yeah. But the budget wasn't huge at that stage. But as the seasons went on, uh, season three, I remember, I remember going on the first day of season three. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll tell you a story before that. Season two, the first day on season two, uh, David Benioff walked up to me and he said, Dad, you might have heard you're dying this year. And I was like, no. Oh. No. He said, don't worry, you're not. He said, and what had happened was one of the writers put me trying to kill Tyrion at the Battle of Blackwater and uh, Pod Payne killing me. 
But when David and Dan saw it and said, no, no, keep him alive, we need him. David then said to me, this first day on set in season two, he said, you're going to die and Arya's going to kill you. And I didn't tell anybody for three years. Talk about no spoilers. Oh, my God. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> that must have been hard to keep all that because from all the <laughs> the interviews and things that I've watched with various, and, and I know Kit a little bit as well, um, from all the interviews, like all of them, Every single member of the cast, it would seem at least, really wasn't privy to any inside scoop. It was like, you got the script and then you figured out if you're dying or not. And that was it. Yeah, well, funny enough, I think it started in in season three or season four, I can't remember. But David and Dan started making the personal phone calls at the start of the season to say, Valar Morghulis, chum, your time is up. Uh, And I, of course, got mine at the start of season five. And, of course, you get the phone call. Uh, will you take a conference call from David and Dan? No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Tell them to call me back next season. We're fine. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so yeah, no, they would, they would, they would make a personal phone call. Or in the case of the top members of the cast, I mean, sometimes the top members of the cast literally find out on the read through. Oh my God. Uh, when they were reading and all oh, right, okay, I'm dead. Good. I'm fine. <laughs> I remember seeing something. Um, I think it was Kit and Amelia that they, she learned that she. She, she, oh, she had got the script. Yeah, spoiler alert, script. by the way, anyone who hasn't seen the, the finales. We'll, we'll, we'll just say that Amelia got the script the night before the read through. Okay. And on the table read, when Kit got to that point, he looked at Amelia and Amelia kind of went, and you could see what an impact that had. Wow. Uh, I mean, on Kit, you, you know, you really could see. Cause the thing about Game of Thrones was, I said, at the start of season three, when we got on set, there really was a buzz. Hmm. We were getting the DVD sales figures, and we could see that this thing was going ballistic. By season four, it had gone crazy. And nobody, I promise you, nobody during season one thought that this show was going to be as big as it was. Nobody My, thought that. I mean, if we knew we had a good show. We yeah. knew we had a good show, but nobody thought it was going to go ballistic the way it did. It was just the most incredible phenomenon. And uh, we were we were a family. Make no mistake about it. I mean, and I'm not just talking about uh, the members of the cast. From the top of the pyramid to the base of the pyramid, everybody, everybody did their jobs and did their jobs perfectly everybody had a passion you talk about no spoilers okay okay let's talk about one episode my favorite episode in the entire show which was season six episode nine battle of the bastards best piece oh. of Bet, i mean better than any movie I've ever oh. seen. quite frankly the best single episode of anything i have ever seen it's stunning um but you talk about no spoilers okay let's talk about the cast no spoilers fair enough it's our job what about the 500 extras Mm. they didn't spoil anything either you know. know we all as a, we were a family we were a family and the worst professional day of my life was my last day in game of thrones when i had at the end of that day when i heard the words that's a series rap on ian Beatty," and i knew i had to leave that family wow. it was all <laughs> it must be really hard like you hear these these similar stories coming from actors that have been in long running shows where they have that you're working every day for months and months and months on end with and and you well, especially with thrones like because there's so many well, first of all it is it is a mohemoth of a show it was the biggest it is it was the biggest thing in the world but the next biggest thing wasn't even close it was yeah. just yeah. i mean no, it was it what was, five or six units a couple of hundred huge. people per unit was absolutely huge. I remember, I mean, I used to, for a couple of years uh, in the early 90s, I uh, moved over to LA with a very, very good friend of mine, my best friend over there, Jerry Irons. Hmm. And him and I, not Jeremy the actor, uh, uh, another uh, Jerry Irons. And uh, him and I were in LA, you know, trying to break through as actors, being bartenders and waiters mostly, but uh, doing what we had to do. Yeah. But one of my favorite places in LA was In and Out Burger. Oh, dude, I, I lived there for quite a while myself as well. A great burger chain. Oh, so, season so five much. premiere, okay, was going to be in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. So, I flew out for the season five premiere, and uh, my friend Jerry lived in uh, LA at this stage. He yeah, still does, lives in Malibu. And I was staying with him, and then him and I. I was going to spend two or three days with him, and then we were going to go up and watch the premiere in San Francisco. 
I hired myself a car. One of the first things I did, literally one of the first things I did, uh, lunchtime in LA on a Wednesday afternoon, I drove straight over to In-N-Out Burger uh, to get myself my burger and my chili fries. And I was really, Off the really secret good. menu that's not secret at all. <laughs> and I got mobbed. I got mobbed in an annoyed burger. I must have taken 100 photographs of people, and it was literally one of the greatest moments of my life. What, what does that feel like? You know, for the, when, the, the first time that happens, you know, when you're on something, you've been working for years and years, and you do this, that, and the other, but now you're on like this thing, and you walk into, in this case, in and out so a burger joint, and yeah. the, just the, the public just go, oh, my God, it's, it's Miriam Trant, bam, and they're over to you. Like, that must be a weird thing. For me, that is, I mean, that is wonderful. I know there are many actors who actually don't, aren't comfortable uh, with, you know, what comes with a certain success, such mm -hmm. as, you know, if you're in Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I remember Kit was very uncomfortable uh, with so much of the public attention uh, because that's that's who Kit is, you know, and he's, Kit's a gorgeous, gorgeous kid. I'm so fond of him. Mm -hmm. um, but I was always reasonably comfortable with it, and uh, I always felt that you know, if so, yeah, especially after Game of Thrones. I mean, before Game of Thrones, nobody wanted my autograph, nobody wanted my photograph. After Game of Thrones, they did. I was absolutely delighted to provide it. I mean, that's I think partly it's it's my job, but also I personally don't have a problem with it. I would have a problem, and it's never happened to me. I would have a problem with, you know, some celebrities, I think they go too far with, you know, when they're outside hiding in bushes, photographing them in their bikinis and their underwear and stuff like that. I think yeah. there is a limit. Absolutely. There is a level at which you should have a certain amount of privacy. Um, yeah. So I do think that, and again, the bigger celebrity, I think that that can happen sometimes. But you know, you look at the biggest celebrities of the of today, and you look at the likes of uh, Brad Pitt, and especially Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is such a wonderful inspiration, I think, to all of us. Absolutely, uh, he's, he's, he he just genuinely seems to be an absolute superstar in every sense of the word. I love that he uh, goes around and he drops what he says, the quote, the H-bomb, now and again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, he's just, he's a magical creature. He's the most wonderful inspiration for every actor out there. Yeah. And, you know, he is such a, an incredibly good actor. Oh, if my God. Look at his body of work. Oh, my goodness, to have a body of work like that. I mean, he is just phenomenal. And I would consider myself an absolutely huge, if not number one fan of Tom Hanks. I think he's just brilliant. Have to, I totally have to agree with you. I think he's wonderful. But I want to get on to, I mean, first, as an actor, Game of Thrones, okay, that must have been just an absolute dream as an actor. Because what I mean by that is because, first of all, you are working with the best writers actors, producers, directors, costume people, stunt, CG, and you know for a fact that while the worlds within Game of Thrones, some t some of them are very fantastical and really, uh, you yeah. know, de dejected from reality, but if you, if you can get yourself to a place where you are real within that world, you know yeah. that the men and women that are going to be painting you and editing and CG and so on, you know that you be real in that world, they will create a world around you that is so unbelievably authentic. It oh, is yeah, it perfect. Unreal. It was, I mean, it was it was perfect. Every single detail, every single unbelievable detail, uh, from costumes, hair, makeup, you know, you name it, props. Um, there was there was a warehouse full of different props, and those were the cups for uh, King's Landing. Those were the cups for Winterfell. You know, I mean, every mm -hmm. single detail was perfect in this show. And you know, we as actors, actually, we had it easy. Mm -hmm. you know, come picked up in a nice car, brought down, got some breakfast, got some coffee, get on your uniform. You've got help to put the uniform on, especially in, in my case, because it was 28 kilos worth of armor. So um, yeah. you get the help of the uniform, then you get your coffee and you walk on set and bang, we're ready to go. Whereas, you know, the makeup people, the crew, uh, all the crew, the electricians, the plasters, the painters, they're all there at four o'clock in the morning, mm. you know, I've been working by the time I got on set they'd been working very very hard for three hours to get everything ready for me and, but it was the most magical unbelievable uh, experience 
And, you know, there were times, you know, working with the actors I was working with, I remember people asked me what one of my favorite scenes was uh, to be in. And I kept saying, well, it was Tyrion's trial during season four, uh, when Tyrion is standing trial in front of his father and his sister. Mm -hmm. And uh, he gives that speech. I have to say, the thing about Game of Thrones is for every 30 minutes or for every minute that you saw on screen, uh, that anybody saw on screen, we filmed 30 minutes mm -hmm. at least. At Tyrion's trial, I don't know, it was 10, 12 minutes on screen. It took four days, four wow. full days of filming that, that wow. trial. 500 extras, uh, you know, the, the, the opulence of, 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 of uh, the Iron Throne room. It was just the most incredible four days. And I stood beside Nikolai Kosterwaldo, Jamie Lannister, mm -hmm. and I watched Peter Dinklage give that speech maybe eight, maybe nine times. Mm -hmm. And every time it was spectacular. I remember at one point turning around to Nikolai, thankfully the camera wasn't on me and I wasn't mic'd up. And I said, Jesus, he's good, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> just, but and it's all... just the most incredible. But Ian, the, the, the acting quality truly was exceptional. I mean, it really, it all was, all of it. But there was, um, for me, there was, I mean, like, um, uh, Conleth is just, oh, my God. Oh, my I, God. I actually, I mean, I've known Conleth now coming on, uh, I don't know. Yeah. 30, 30, 35 years I've known Conleth, and I, I hate Conleth. <laughs> <laughs> he puts on... He puts on a character the way I would put on a coat. It would take me weeks. It would take me months. And he just shrugs it on and bang, there he is. He is a spectacular actor. Do you know, the, the for me, the last couple of episodes or even the last season or two, especially when, when the shit had hit the fan and they all knew that they were done, basically. And a, you know, uh, Conleth's uh, exit, basically, his death scene, that, that conversation that himself and, um, and Tyrion had on the steps of, of the Iron Throne, and that was utterly beautiful. I mean, oh I mean, my god, heartbreaking. absolutely heartbreaking. And I only got, and I mean, I do know, and I can tell you this without fear or favor, Conleth and Peter struck up a very, very close friendship very quickly into the series, and that carried through all the way of them working together. Mm -hmm. I would tell you, Conleth Hill is a terrible practical joker. <laughs> Terrible, terrible, terrible joker on set. You know, he, he will, he will, when he's on, when he's not on camera, he'd be making these faces at you and stuff like that. And then if you share a scene with him, this has happened to me more than once with Conleth. He doesn't say it to you. He actually says it to the director. So you've done the rehearsal and Conleth turns around to the director and says, is he going to do it like that? <laughs> <laughs> but Conleth, Conleth is fantastic. And the scenes with Conleth and Peter uh, were rooted in, a very strong friendship that they, I'm sure, have to this day. Uh, both stunning actors, by the way. Mm. Uh, no, uh, no harm in telling you well, all he, that. Uh, both Conleth and Peter are the very top of their game. The there, there isn't a weak link in the whole thing. There isn't a weak link in the whole thing. Yourself, very much included, man. You're absolutely wonderful in it. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I was lucky <laughs> again. I was lucky for the first four and a half uh, seasons. Uh, I was playing a character that was, if you like. In the books, perhaps a little two-dimensional uh, than some of the more uh, obvious, more rounded characters. But I was given a, a, a lot of uh, advice when I needed it, but also a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, and I noticed as the seasons went on, I haven't read the books yet, by the way. I've got them all. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting until Winds of Winter is published before I start reading the books. But I did my research on the character as he was seen in the books. And I did notice that as the seasons went on, my character was getting quite a lot of other characters' uh, points of view as seen from the book. Uh -huh. In other words, they were bringing in other characters and I was doing the stuff that those other characters were doing in the book. So I did see and I believe that uh, both uh, David and Dan were being very, very generous to me in those terms. They were being extraordinarily generous, and that culminated in season five. Uh, season five was uh, an absolutely stunning season for me, um, and uh, the end I got was spectacular. Mm. I mean, the end, my 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 death was spectacular. I still believe it's the most expensive single death 
ever filmed on Game of Thrones, at least it certainly was up to the end of uh, season six. Um, and to me, I was aware when I got the scripts for those last two episodes, that this was a gift to me from David and Dan. It was like, here you go. Here is the best dead scene you're ever going to have. Mm. The most challenging two uh, scenes you're ever going to do as an actor. Oh, you'll be working with the best director you've ever worked with and the best crew. Try not to mess it up too much. Will you? <laughs> so, no I no was, pressure. I was, I was strongly aware that I was being given a gift here. Now, they were, I say, two nightmare scenes, two horrible scenes. Yeah. But um, I was strongly aware that that was a gift. Okay, two little quick things, uh, and then we'll move on to the next project. Uh, I'm, I'm more more curious myself than anything else. Um, uh, or maybe can you say did who was maybe your favorite? If you if you're willing to say your favorite character Lena. or your favorite actor yeah. that you uh, Lena 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 twice on Sundays. Lena was wonderful. I probably spent more time working with Lena uh, than anybody else, and she's so unlike. Cersei Lannister, uh, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, we just have so you up on the screen now, yourself and Lena, and your costume. Um, it's it's the scene where just before she's marched naked through the, uh, on the way into that um, uh, that building. Uh, this is the the clip. Um, but yeah, she. I mean, she. First of all, she's a wonderful actress. Um, mm-hmm. But to have like same as uh, same as. Um, as uh, Joffrey as well, wonderful actor. Because like, if you despise these people, with every fiber of your being, you hate them so They're much. Doing their They're doing their job. Doing their job. But what was Lena like? Uh, what's Lena like? Not Cersei. What's well, Lena she's like? Stunning girl. She's a stunning girl. I mean, she is a, a role model. Uh, she speaks out uh, where it counts. Mm. Um, she is so warm. She is funny. Uh, she's got an incredible sense of humor. She's a wonderful mother. Um, she's just a great, great, incredible girl, and as I say, a wonderful actress. You know, there'd be times uh, whenever I was uh, working with her in the same scene, and again, maybe I'd be off camera or something, and I would just dare, see her do something, maybe just change the look slightly or raise an eyebrow slightly, and the subtlety of her performance was incredible. I, to this day, my favourite character in Game of Thrones was Cersei Lannister. She's absolutely wonderful. I couldn't wait to see her on screen again. Such an arc. The the actor that you, the the character you cannot wait to see on screen again. And you're sitting there waiting for them to come on. That's your favorite character. Well, that was mine. Yeah. Cersei Lannister. And Lena was just stunning. Stunning. What a wonderful arc. The other person that I was privileged uh, to work with, and not just work with, but um, during uh, the Purple Wedding, Mm -hmm. Where I was standing, uh, the camera had been put there for one of the scenes. So I was basically, where you go back to the tent, chill out for an hour or so while we film from your point of view. And the person sitting beside me was Dame Diana Rigg, and she was broken as well. Where you go. And Dame Diana and I spent about an hour in uh, our set-up tent in Dubrovnik, and I sat and listened to Dame Diana's stories for an hour, and I was just absolutely Mm. enamored, absolutely enamored. I never dreamed, as a younger actor, I never dreamed I would ever get to meet Dame Diana, let alone Mm. work with her, and let alone share a wonderful afternoon with her. So, you know, these have been some of the benefits of being in Game of Thrones. Say, you know, uh, all of the actors that I personally worked with, and I was probably luckier than most because I was based in King's Landing, and because I was there for the big scenes, Mm. Uh, things like you know the Purple Wedding and Tyrion's trial. I got to meet and work with a very very large number of the cast, and it was absolutely incredible. Yeah, that's amazing, buddy. Absolutely amazing. I uh, just a quick note here. We have Esther Jester watching in. She's saying that she was um, she was Lena's hair double for those scenes where Lena had to get her all her hair cut off, like really roughly, and then march through the thing. So Esther Jester's watching in. She says she absolutely loved you in Game of Thrones and misses it dearly. And she was Lena's uh, she was Lena's hair double. Um, Esther, thank you so much for that. Um, I unfortunately uh, wasn't there for the Walk of Shame because Cersei had sent me away to Bravos with that Egypt Tyrell. So uh, and also I I I had flown home the day before they filmed the Walk of Shame, but I I knew who uh, the body double was. 
uh, for Lena on that day. I didn't realize you were the hair double. That's a brilliant job, a job well done, and something you should be very, very proud of because I find, find that to be one of the most iconic, most powerful scenes in the entire series of Game of Thrones because who would have imagined you would have felt sorry I know, I know, right? I mean, incredible, incredible stuff. So, and well done, Esther. Brilliant, brilliant job. We have a question here from Andy Purton. Uh, he's watching in from New York. Uh, he says, um, if you were given the opportunity um, to play any part within any of the different worlds, whether it be Dorne or King's Landing or uh, the Night's Watch or any of the various worlds within Thrones, uh, uh, which role would you play or which world would you exist in? Uh, interesting question, Andy. Uh, I was lucky enough to get married. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, it was the biggest gift I ever had in my life. I was more than happy with Meryn. And I mean, I was genuinely happy to play Meryn. It was it was quite challenging because he, he's nothing like the, I, the, the person I am. He was, if you like, the complete opposite. And then we found out just how opposite, what a monster he turned out to be toward the end. The other thing is, once you see a character in Game of Thrones... The show was so well cast, you could not imagine anybody else playing that character. You couldn't begin to imagine anybody but Peter as Absolutely. Uh, uh, Charles as uh, oh, Tyrone. You know, oh, every character what was so perfectly realized. Uh, in a different lifestyle, might have been nice to have a go at Braun because he was such an endearing, wonderful, up and down character. I thoroughly enjoyed Braun's character. Mm. But again, who else could play him? I know. Absolutely awesome. But that nicely takes us on to your next project, which seems to have uh, the same sort of gravitas that the game, uh, the Thrones had, where I think it might potentially go on to be an absolute mammoth of a show as well. And uh, of course, the show I'm talking about, which is out right now. And we have quite a lot of people uh, watching in that are currently watching this. And of course, it's uh, Gangs of London. Thanks a lot. Indeed, it was uh, it was uh, re remarkable because um, I didn't uh, audition for Gangs of London. Uh, I was well, that's nice. in it, which was you know uh, remarkable. It was a real it was a real uh, uh, boost for me. You know, whenever you actually get offered a role without audition, it's quite unusual. And um, it was not a particularly big role. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a cracking one. It was a really, it was good fun. It was good fun to do it. And working with Gareth Evans, who did the raid, and the raid too was spectacular, is all I can say. But the best thing about Gangs of London was uh, twofold. Once, uh, for uh, for one, should I say, I got to work with Michelle Farley for the first time. She's wonderful. I never worked with Michelle on Game of Thrones. We had never been in the same scene together. So to get to work with Michelle was truly, truly spectacular. Another wonderful actress from our shores. Yeah. Uh, and also on the second day I was working uh, with Michelle, I got to play my role. Uh, in my role, I was the husband of uh, um, uh, Francis Tumbleby. Who I'd never worked with before, and Frances is just the most incredible actress as well. Uh, funny, her uh, sister Roma, who was another titan of the uh, local arts scene here, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, passed away uh, just last week. Um, but to work with Michelle and Frances that particular day was just for me. I mean, honestly, I was like a puppy dog. It was embarrassing. I was gushing. I was dribbling. I was dribbling. It was awful. It was embarrassing. Ah, so, uh, so cute. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to give um, the trailer a spin. Um, so for anyone who hasn't um, heard about this, well, I don't know what rock you're living under, but um, yeah, let's give the trailer a spin and then we'll, uh, we'll talk to you uh, on the other end of it. No problem. We're born into a certain world. It's chosen for us. Some might think it's brutal. No! 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 Please! Please don't kill me! I say it's glorious. Someone chose to kill Finn Wallace. Today we mourn the loss of a great man. But tomorrow it will be business as usual. Mm -hmm. 
everything stops. Until I find out who killed him. There was a time when nobody would have dared touch this family. I'm gonna make things right, Mum. Sean Wallace himself tasking me to find a guy who killed his father. Up the tour up the pub. Elliot. You did all that on your own. What was it? Six of them? Oh, eight. But I had a dart, so. My father was taken from us on the streets of London. And now London will deliver to us those that took him. We are making enemies out of business partners. We've got to find a peaceful solution to this. I'm not interested in peace. What kind of trouble are you in? If you knew what I was doing, you'd be proud of me. Hey, Tim, get Sean out of here now! Once you enter this world, you can build an empire. You can be a king. Unbelievably awesome does yeah, that look. Yeah, oh it's my a, god. Cracking show. I mean, Gareth Evans uh, originally uh, devised it and he directed many of the episodes, including one of the two episodes that I'm in. Uh, lovely guy, fantastic, fantastic director. But the, the style of the show, uh, you know, the uh, and I, I would have to I would have to say I've, I've watched uh, several of the episodes and Michelle Fairley is just mind mind blowingly good in it. I mean she's and, awesome I mean, anyway. She's so, she's she's great in everything. I, I genuinely have never seen she does, but she's playing such a different character to for example, Caitlin Stark. Mm. I mean, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, people are in for a treat when they watch this show. I can't wait. I can't wait. It's, it's on it's on my uh it's on my watch list and I'll be I'll be kicking off tonight. <laughs> I got a question um, before we continue with uh, with some game of uh, I'm gonna say Game of Thrones again, Gangs of London. You know, I was just saying to you off the air, it's uh, Game of Thrones was abbreviated to GOT, and now you're on GOL. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so cool? uh, G seems to be a lucky letter at the moment. I know, so. right? <laughs> uh, my good buddy Lance Nelson is watching, and he was asking, uh, what was it like to play such a controversial figure, Michael Stone, on the Mo Molan drama? Wow, Lance, and, I, think Lance, I think Lance might be one of my friends on Facebook. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, uh, Lance is a good friend of ours. He's a writer. Right, very good. Indeed. Yeah, I know Lance. And he also uh, goes on to say, what research did you do into the character? Well, again, uh, you know, I quite enjoy playing uh, real-life characters. Uh, I've done it more than once. I actually played Jerry Adams uh, in The Journey. And what I tend to do is, uh, for example, with... Uh, uh, playing Michael Stone in the TV film Mo, got to work with the incredibly wonderful Julie Walters. I mean, oh, oh my goodness, talk about a bucket list. Mm. Uh, that's one I'll take to my grave with me. The most remarkable, wonderful, decent, lovely, lovely woman. And what an incredible actress and icon. Mm. Um, oh, absolutely. I did, I mean, I did the research. Living in Belfast, obviously, I remember uh, what he did. Uh, I remember the news stories, so uh, I knew where he lived, so therefore I knew his accent as well. I'd done the, the research on, you know, any video of him and stuff like that. It was a very interesting uh, role to play, uh, because at the time I played it, he was back in prison again. He had done that thing at Stormont, the opening of uh, Parliament buildings in Stormont, where he'd uh, tried to sort of... Um, gate crash the party <laughs> he was taken away and locked up again uh, but I thought it was important you know and I always do think it is important Lance to get the characters as close as you can 
So whatever video you can find, whatever audio you can find, whatever news reports you can find, any interviews you can find, just to get the stance, to get the look, to get the accent, to get the speech patterns, uh, you know, whatever that requires. And that's a challenge. Mm. So that whenever you're uh, playing that character on screen, people will look at that character and say, oh, yeah, that's Michael. So, oh, oh, that's Jerry Adams. Yeah, that's who, yeah, I know that's who that is. I know that. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't want to try and uh, be a mimic, but you do want to get the essence. Oh, absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I really enjoy playing characters that, you know, you can do that with characters who lived, characters who are part of our history. Uh, so it was, a, it was a great, it was a great character to play. It was a, a fun character to play. I really enjoyed my time working on Mo, and as I say, working with the incomparable Julie Walters, having two scenes with her. Uh, the other thing was just mentioning it um, when I was doing the prison scene, when Mo Molum comes into prison to discuss. A peace process with the loyalists here in prison and the, you know the leading loyalists in prison uh my beautiful friend mark o'shea who sadly passed away a couple of years back um mark played johnny adair and that was one of my wonderful memories of of, of uh, playing michael stone was the chance to uh, play in front of julie walters and with julie walters and with mark o'shea so it's it's one of my wonderful wonderful memories uh but really enjoyed it and enjoyed doing the research to try and get the character as good as possible and it was funny we were we were doing a scene in one of the big uh, shopping centers in uh belfast actually i think it was uh, the victoria center mm -hmm. mo molum signing books and michael stone comes up to give her one of his paintings and as i was walking on set you know there were members of the public passing by and one of them turned around to me and said all right michael how's it going <laughs> so that was nice they immediately recognized who i was playing so uh, yeah no excellent it's it good fun that's awesome and well, what's what's next for you what's what's coming up or, or is there anything in particular you're no. looking for or anything that no unfortunately uh, because of uh the, the events now of basically course, of course of course everybody's in lockdown nobody jobs were cancelled jobs have been postponed uh i do manage thank goodness uh to get the odd voiceover uh, so i'm still doing bits and pieces of voiceover uh, work um i do i have been offered a, a role in a, in a four part series uh that hopefully starts filming in the netherlands in august uh, hopefully it'll mm -hmm. all depend on what happens next uh, we're all waiting to see basically um the only good news i suppose is there will probably when the lockdown lifts and production resumes that there will be a load of stuff there that has been postponed as well as the stuff that was expected to be made you know later on in the year so hopefully there'll be a few more rules up for grabs i see myself very very much as a jobbing character actor that's who i am mm. uh, so any budding directors out there producers you know you need me for a day give me a shot i'll be here <laughs> absolutely buddy um yeah um yeah no that's i mean obviously with with the corona thing now that's that's put a bit of a damper on, on a thing but I th on, on everything really but i, I could totally agree with you i think there's going to be uh, an abundance of work um available afterwards but you know through all of this and talking thrones and talking um well a number of things and we talk michelle and yourself and a number i'm, I'm very proud of of just the 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 level of talent that's come out of our fire of our fair shores um you know the quality of filmmakers in every respect in every department that ireland as an island has got to offer is incredible it's world class and i couldn't uh, agree with you more couldn't agree with you more i do think per capita both north and south that mm -hmm. we have uh, a pool of talent that uh, outweighs and exceeds per capita any other place in the world i think uh, mm -hmm. i think we have some phenomenal uh, talent here and um, to see that talent you know finally get recognized is is a huge boost especially the people coming into the profession you know mm -hmm. in, uh, in northern ireland we have northern ireland screen who does so much to bring in so many different productions and it's amazing how many different productions are filmed uh, in the province at the moment uh, many people don't know in fact that line of duty and that wonderful BBC series, probably the best British mm -hmm. series I have seen yeah. with my mate, the wonderful Adrian Dunbar. Absolutely. It's filmed exclusively in Belfast. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and we have other productions coming in. We have other productions that have come in. Northern Ireland have done a, a fantastic job of bringing productions into this province. But it's also allowed us, you know, when we got Game of Thrones, 
uh, it was like a training ground. Uh, you were working with the best people in the business. Uh, and people here were learning uh, as a result of being on set on Game of Thrones, uh, with the result that we now have some of the best film crews in the business right here at home. Absolutely, yeah. That'll, that'll continue. Because they, they duplicated their, was it was a couple of years ago, they said they were going to build uh, essentially a duplicate Titanic Studios. And now they have, they've doubled it in size. Now it's a huge, it's the biggest in the country with the exception of Ardmore, I think. Um, and But that's and in the also, south. And also on the far shore of Belfast Lock, they've built another uh, set of studios. Mm -hmm. uh, plus we've had, the, we've had the studios up in Bam Bridge. We have the studios in the Castle Ray Road. We have some of the best locations in the world. So uh, I would I would, I would would say that uh, the future looks very very good absolutely uh, i couldn't agree more we'll get a couple of questions um so if you want to get your questions into and we're going to wrap up pretty soon we're we're already way over the hour buddy but uh i'm just loving this conversation so i thought i'd, I'd let it run uh we'll get a couple of questions in so again as i say if you want to um you want to get a question to in uh pop them into the chat uh sections of the various um live streams so facebook twitter twitch uh, YouTube and uh, LinkedIn. They're all there and it'll come into us. Uh, let's see, what do we got here? Peter here in London's asking, uh, Peter's an actor and he's saying, how or what would you say is the best thing f to get into something like Thrones or one of these big projects? But now that the, the industry's like, the one line parts are now, that used to go to, you know, budding actors are now going to like somebody who's got three years at errata or getting the one liner. So how do you, get into a room and get be seen by someone like Nina when you know it's one of these things do you have the credits no well you can't see Nina but without seeing Nina you can't get the credits so yeah. what do you do yeah I mean it's, it's very very tough especially if you're a younger actor starting out I mean you know the first thing you need more than anything else I think is an agent mm -hmm. uh, and you know there's ways of getting an agent uh, you know you can do your own showroom Mm -hmm. uh, get a friend to uh, film you on your iPhone, uh, get a speech, whatever speech it is. It could be any speech from any film, something that touches you, something that you can do truthfully uh, to make the most of your talent. Um, and, uh, you know, get it out there, get it out there to agents, because that is the one thing an actor needs. An actor needs an agent. Uh, it's the way that he can get work. It's a way that he can get put up for auditions, even if it's only one line. And let me tell you something. One line doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember my uh, late mother talking about uh, a play she had uh, seen. It was a television version of one of the Shakespeare plays. And she had been watching it. And uh, an actor came on. And he was to give a line. I think, it was, I think it was Richard III. I might be wrong. But he was to give a line to the king. He had one line, he delivered a line, and then he put his hands in his pocket in front of the king and sauntered off. That actor was Charles Dance. Wow. Wow. And now, now that is, no, that's, Charles Dance. That, do, that dude's a thespian. Like, you know, I don't know the man, I've never met him, but he seems like he is like an actor's actor. Like, he seems to me like a thespian, like a... You know what I mean? Like, he seems like he just got so much gravitas. It's amazing. I love it. He's, he's, a, so wonder, he's a wonderful actor, a wonderful guy. And again, you know, whenever you're in real life, he's light, he's funny, he's charming. Uh, but then you get him in a Tywin Lannister mood. And oh. my goodness, the gravitas he brought to that oh. role. Uh, but the gravitas he brings to all sorts of different roles. He's a, he's a remarkable actor. Uh, uh, Charles, and I say, a very, very nice man. But once again, just that last piece of advice, you know, kick the door down, break the door down, get your name out there, get photographs taken, do a show reel, do two or three different speeches, get them off the agents, get yourself any agent. Mm -hmm. That's the way you're going to get through the door. Yeah, and you got an awesome one, David. What a sweetheart. He's such a nice guy. Dave Blazenby and Vivian Clore is an absolutely unbelievable agent and a friend. I mean, yeah. he's, he's become very, very, very short order, my, uh, my dear, dear friend. Uh, he is a wonderful agent. He gets me seen for stuff that, you know, five, six years ago I wouldn't have dreamt that I could have got seen for. And he has been, you know, kicking down doors on my behalf for an awfully long time. It's mm -hmm. funny. When I first went to meet David, interesting little story, I first went to meet David and uh, it was just after season five had finished uh, filming, but it wasn't, it hadn't been released yet. 
And uh, I went in this office and I said, look, you know, looking for uh, London representation. He said, well, I really want to represent you. I said, well, you know, you know, I'm sure you've uh, Game of Thrones. He says, no, I haven't watched Game of Thrones. Okay. Excuse me? I said, well, why do you want to represent me? He says, because I saw you in Starred Up. Oh, wow. Which was the prison film we did here with uh, Jack O'Connell and Ben yeah. Mendelsohn. What a great um, movie, by the way. That is a cracking movie. <laughs> cracking movie yeah and i really enjoyed my time on it too mm. uh jack was a lovely guy and ben was just a hoot yeah. um but that was it i was sold i said you got me you want me you got me mm. <laughs> such a sweetheart as well you know and it's 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 so hard it's so easy to you know to be like good at what you do like there are so many great agents out there but not all of them are very nice um david's awesome and he's a awesome guy as well you know he's such a nice guy too um and the lovely thing about david is you know he get as i say he does get me seen for stuff that i didn't think i would get in the door for and he knocks down the doors on my behalf and he is just wonderful and has it has become a friend mm. has become a really really close friend i love him to bits and pieces okay sarah in dublin uh, on our own fair shores is asking when you get sent a script um what is it that you look for in the character that stands out to you that you go do you know what i gotta play this guy for x reason yeah, I think, I mean, obviously being, uh, Sarah being a jo uh, jobbing actor, uh, you know, you don't always get the choice. You audition for any role that's going, and if it's offered to you, bingo, that'll put food on the table for a week or two. You know, that is what we do. That is what we are as actors. Uh, but if I'm lucky enough, if I'm lucky enough to get offered a role, I when I read the script, I try and find... I remember Gabriel Byrne, that wonderful, mm. incredible Dublin actor, always oh, yeah. said, find the truth. Find the truth of the character, uh, whatever that truth is. Because if you believe that truth, you'll make other people believe that truth. The worst thing that can possibly happen for me as an actor is for someone to say, eh, but he's not bad in that. Mm. No, I don't want them to say that. I want them to say, I hate that guy. Yeah. Or I love that guy. Or... Mm. This guy's really, you know, whatever it is that... You if you know, see you acting, you're doing it wrong. If you see the acting, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And that was the trick, I suppose, when I was playing uh, Marin Tramp in Game of Thrones. That, you know, whenever people come up to me and say, I hate that, then that's it. Job done. Excellent. Job done. To me, it's find the truth. Yeah. In the most improbable line you might have to say, you have to find the truth of it. You have to make the person watching you on this performance, believe in that character and what that character said. Uh, so if I say, if I'm lucky enough to get offered a role, that's the first thing I look when I'm looking through the script and I'm reading what this character has to say and what his place is in this story. What is this character's truth? And how do I portray that truth onto the screen? That's my probable, probably that's my number one starting point. What's the truth? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We've got a question here from Esther Jester, who was, uh, who was Lena's hair double. She's saying, it's quite long here. Let's see. i got a question for you, Jay. You can ask Ian uh, to do what you talked about. Okay. If you want to be an actor, uh, do you have to live and breathe it 24-7? Uh, she currently works as a, a swim instructor and a horse riding instructor. Um, is, that, is that hindering uh, her ability to, to pursue the acting if she's you know, making ends meet and making rent with other things? Why on earth would it? I know of very few actors. I have met very, very, very few actors uh, that didn't at one time or another do this job or do that job or do another job to put food in the table, to put a roof over their heads. At mm -hmm. uh, 90%, 95% of the actors in the world today are unemployed. Oh, absolutely. What, actually, sorry, today, 100% of the actors. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> But, uh, you know, at any one time... And that so includes all the super famous ones, by the way, people. Never, never underestimate an experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're working as a swimming instructor and you're horse riding. Never underestimate that. What if you get a role one day, Esther, where you need to ride a horse? Mm -hmm. What if you get a role one day where you have to save somebody's life at sea? Mm-hmm. You know, swimming will come in real handy. Horse riding will come in real handy. The people you meet during these times that you're doing these jobs, you know, look at them, watch them. Maybe you'll get a character one day 
mm-hmm. maybe that you, you will you get a role one day where you can say oh that reminds me of that person and you can use something never underestimate experience whatever that experience is because experience will help you when you get a role yeah because i mean at the end of the day as an actor you're 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 pretending to be a person and how can you pretend to be another person if you have no life experience Yes, absolutely. absolutely. How can you do I was to say, I know very, very few actors that in their days and in their time of uh, unemployment did not do whatever job they could get. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is this is the life. This is the life we have chosen. Yeah, I think um, f- for me anyway, I think the for everyone, I suppose, um, you got to be in it for the right reasons. If you want to be famous or rich or whatever, then okay, whatever, but it's most likely not going to happen. you got to be in it for the right reasons. Yes, you have to have talent, but you got to, I think, I mean, I think maybe you'll agree with me on this. The actual acting is about 10% of your of what you do. The other 80-odd percent is marketing yourself, getting an agent, going to auditions, making people be aware that you exist and that you are here and you can do X, Y, and Z. And to, and to never give up. I know that's cliche, but never give up. Never give up. Never take no for an answer. Always, always believe in yourself because if you don't have self-belief, it's not going to work out. And acting is not... A job it is a vocation mm-hmm. it's if you can't do anything else if you love it so much that you cannot be satisfied with doing something else that's what makes you an actor yeah i think it's a there are, i mean there are tough times oh, wow. there are tough times i remember uh, uh, after uh, the film alexander i don't think i worked for like 12 months mm. nothing you know, so I mean, it was. Uh, it was. There are tough times, and you can go through periods. I went through a period not that long ago where I didn't work for more than a year, and that was after Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, you know, so that's the nature of the beast. Just, nature of the business. You just never know where the next one's coming from. Which is, I think that somebody asked me that question before, and and they said, you know, I think actors get paid way too much, and and for the most part, I suppose that's true. <laughs> but I, you know, I honestly think that the the pay, like. Okay, you're now you've just landed this big movie, whatever it is, and they pay you three million dollars to do this film. I don't believe that they're paying you three million dollars to do that role. I believe they're paying you three million dollars for the past twenty five years that it took to get to that role. Let me tell you something. I, I do remember a story Dustin Hoffman told that he was being interviewed a while back, quite a few years ago, but he was being interviewed, and obviously he had great success with the Graduate and then. Uh, Urban Cowboy and all those wonderful uh, films. He, he did Tootsie, through. what a great movie that is. Uh, Kramer versus Kramer and then all through the 80s as well. And he was being interviewed and he said, you know, it, it, all the success I've had since, it wasn't worth it. Uh, for the times before The Graduate, which he described as just being absolutely dreadful. Absolutely wow. dreadful. And the other reason, the other reason that they're paying $3 million for they're paying $3 million because they know that actor will bring in that $3 million at the box. Oh, office. absolutely. Of course. Plus, 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 plus. Of course. You know, I mean, it's a business. It's show business. It's not show friends. Absolutely. It's not show for nothing. It's show business. And it is a business. Absolutely. And that's how we all have to treat you need to you need to remember that. I mean, I've I've started producing in the last six or seven years, as you know. We and you so graciously came on and done Hayfields with us. Um, but I, I, after doing that, or not specifically Hayfields, but after doing or being in producing, I will never ever complain about an actor again ever because yeah. it's such a nice you, as you said earlier you get picked up in a car you're driven to a place you're given coffee da, da, da. you know as a producer it's a whole different ball, ball game but yes yeah. you know tom cruise or whoever isn't hired just for the sake of it you know what i mean like there's there's a reason behind all of this he's going to guarantee exit the box office and he's going to make the money and he's also hard because let me tell you something there are very 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 I, I can't think of one single actor or actress who you know at the top of their game whether it be in america or whether it be here that isn't worth every penny of what they pay them uh, you know whatever whatever you whatever actor that happens to be whether it be tom hanks or brad pitt mm. uh whether it be actors here like stephen graham uh, oh, another, a, a wonderful, wonderful british actor uh jody comer you know uh, they're worth it absolutely worth every single penny that they get i, I couldn't mean, so. i couldn't agree with you more uh, i really really couldn't agree with you more i think uh it's it's a tough long slog and when you get there and people also they they see you know brad pitt or whatever it is they see him on a red carpet and they think oh that's so glamorous what they didn't see is the past 
nine months. And when you see Brad or whoever on a red carpet, trust me, and I'm sure you'll agree with me on this one, the only thing going through his or her head is, I want to sleep. They've just done the movie, and they've been up at four o'clock in the morning and sitting in the uh, hair and makeup chair for hours, and then 18-hour day. Then the movie's done, and then you've got to do a world fucking tour of a press junket answering the same questions 25 times a day. So when you get to the carpet, you're just like, I am done with this thing already <laughs> like, yeah Whew, i'm out of here so yeah hey, anybody it's it's been an absolute pleasure one little thing before i go i would like to ask all the guests now that um we're going through this corona uh thing when uh when this is over when when we're all permitted to go back outside and leave our humble abodes uh what's the first thing that you're looking forward to and it can be anything for me, it's a haircut. Um, um, this is not. This is not well, by mistake. Yeah. <laughs> my hair. My hair. I don't think I'm too worried about mine because it's falling out anyway. But uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. That's a very, very good question. I think I would um, love a McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Fair, do you know what? Fair enough. I was just talking to a friend the other day about the same thing. I want a Starbucks, Starbucks chai tea latte. I Fair love enough. them. Yeah, so I good. think you know the idea of actually going out, going to you know a restaurant that you like, going to the movies, whatever you know, just to get back to uh, some level of normality would be would be something uh, to look forward to and to really, really enjoy. Ian, you've been an absolute superstar, my friend. Thank you so much, and uh, yeah. We will uh, see you in, in uh, Gangs of London um, in, the next, in the next days. Ian, thank you so much, buddy. Um, thanks, buddy. It's been a pleasure. And for me, you look after yourself, and thanks to everybody watching out there. Thank thanks. you. Don't forget to subscribe to The Hub for the latest episodes. You can find us on all your favorite podcast platforms and media. The Hub, your weekly fix of all things film and television and some other stuff. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Jason Mathewson.